please press your P plus. Oh, let's try that. P plus if you are in attendance. I am not aware of, uh, at least recollection doesn't tell me that I've, I'm aware of any absences, but I see Supervisor Zerban is absent and Supervisor Michael. And we are missing someone who didn't, uh, nope, that's right, no it isn't. Who else did we not get? Zerban Gable. That's all right. It's too late now, but we will show. Record will show that Supervisor Gable is in attendance. All right, bear with me for one second. We're trying to get a microphone working there, so let me just uh, grab my agenda. Supervisor Michael is on his way in, so we will also have him down as being here. Announcements of the chair, I do not believe I have any. Citizen comments. Any citizen wishing to speak, please move to the microphone. You have five minutes. Seeing none, citizen comments are closed. Now announcements of the chair, I still have none. Supervisor reports. Any supervisor wishing to make a report? <coughs> supervisor Rose. Press your button if you did. Try it again. Thank you. Uh, the uh, Kenosha Community Health Center, which as you probably know, is located on, at 14th Avenue, uh, 6226 14th Avenue. Uh, we'll be giving tours of the facility next week as part of the National uh, America's Ce Celebrating America's Health Centers, uh, turning the vision into reality. The uh, director of the health center, Jack Waters, has invited us to uh, tour the facility. Uh, a organized tour for county board supervisors and in particular the Human Services Committee uh, is set for next Monday uh, at 5 p.m. I would encourage your attendance. The Human Services Committee is uh, committed to be in attendance. I think it will be a good opportunity for, see, for you to see what the Community Health Center is all about. Uh, the county does work with them as do hospitals in this community. You probably have constituents. Uh, or questions from constituents about it, I would encourage your attendance Monday at 5 p.m. Thank you. Uh, also, I would uh, indicate that uh, Frank Matteo, on June 18th, the health director, did retire, if you were not aware of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. I received the letter as well. It was not specific about Monday night's uh, event, so I appreciate the uh, heads up and also would encourage everyone uh, to attend if you are available. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor O'Day. Thank you, Chairman. I attended my first Brookside meeting yesterday at 3 o'clock, and I have a couple of items. One you have on your desk, it's the premiere showing of Somebody Special. It's a movie that's going to be on uh, Tuesday the 10th at 10 a.m., and Brookside is in part of the movie. Uh, I understand the uh, director has previewed it, and it's uh, there's a lot of fun parts and some tears, so it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. They're going to have like a premiere thing. They're going to do the red carpet. Anybody that can attend it, uh, please do. The other thing is the family picnic, the annual family picnic, is uh, August 18th at 10 o'clock to 1.30. They're going to have uh, live entertainment, classic cars, a lot of food, a dunk tank, uh, all the immediate family residents. Uh, it's well attended. All the supervisors are invited to attend. I did not put that on anybody's desk. If they wanted more information or make a phone call to the Brookside, they, they have the information here. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Grady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Buildings and Grounds Committee held their August meeting this evening at the uh, 
County Building and Highway 1545, took a tour of the building, viewing all the different departments, and were brought up to speed just upon that building and its function, its uses. During our meeting, we went over several items. Perhaps the most pertinent is the Public Safety Building addition immediately to our north, brought up to speed on how that is coming together, and it's substantially complete in terms of its shell. The inside is anywhere between 70 and 90 percent complete. By the end of this month, it's anticipated the uh, Kenosha Police Department will be moved into that facility. So we're going along as we predicted. Um, another interesting feature is we have a little bit of correspondence from our architects, Zimmerman out of Milwaukee, and they've documented for us the things that have gone into that building to make it a quote unquote green building, ecologically friendly, both in terms of its design, construction, and the amount of energy it will use. Um, I don't think this will be certified as what is called a lead building, L-E-E-D, which is among the upper echelons, rather difficult to attain. But it is interesting to note that we have proceeded down the path of trying to make this a good, viable building for now and for the future. On a secondary note, last month the uh, Kenosha Bicycle Committee, which had a total of four meetings, concluded its last meeting. I was a representative for Kenosha County. And on each one of your desks, you should have a single page which designates the findings and conclusions of that committee and try to progress in the area of having Kenosha being a more bicycle-friendly community. Just to highlight the three things that came out of that committee are, in order of importance, funds to complete a countywide bicycle plan, that is a map and an infrastructure uh, arrangement and idea. Number two, provide a shared use path along Highway County K between I-94 and Highway H. And then finally, provide bike lanes on County Highway H between State Highway 50 and the Illinois border. So this is the wish list. This is just the beginning point. This is where we say we've identified the things we think are important. And that is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Grady. <coughs> Supervisor Noble. Thank you, Chairman Molinaro. Uh, I want to report on the administration committee meeting from last Wednesday. The committee received a dart from the Kenosha News for tabling the matter uh, up to 90 days, and it will be on the administration agenda each month, and the uh, item on the agenda will be a discussion and possible resolution regarding compensation package for county board supervisors. If a resolution emerges prior to the 90 days, we will bring it to the county board. The assignment of the committee has been somewhat convoluted. To some, it's nothing more than dealing with Supervisor Frederick's resolution that focuses on health insurance. And that resolution calls for an increase in the contribution beginning on 1-1 of 2011, increasing it from 15% to 20%. And also then it uh, uh, deals with eliminating supervisors' access to health insurance in 2012. Uh, Chairman Melonero asked us to expand the review to, in to include the entire compensation package for county supervisors, and that is what the committee is doing. Everyone agrees supervisors should contribute more than 15 percent. I think that was the consensus of what I was hearing that night. However, most supervisors believe we cannot change the compensation package for any elected official in the middle of the term. Uh, the night of the meeting, uh, there was an article in the paper and counsel for the town of Paris ruled that they cannot change the compensation package for the clerk treasurer in the middle of the term for the, for the town of Paris. So clearly, either you can or you can't. There's no middle ground. So one of the reasons it was tabled is to get an AG opinion on changing the compensation package for elected positions in the middle of the term. The second major reason for tabling is to get an opinion or at least a better understanding regarding the new federal universal health insurance laws relating to limiting or in Supervisor Frederick's resolution eliminating access to any employee to of, of an employees and in this case county supervisors to health insurance beginning in 2012. The question of county supervisors getting health insurance or not getting health insurance doesn't it take effect in two th until 2012. So tabling for 90 days does not fiscally impact the county in any way. 
The committee is made up of an, of an accountant, an attorney, a self-employed contractor, two people who are retired but formerly held elected positions as clerk of courts and the sheriff. The committee is being thorough and objective and will bring a recommendation forward in a fiscally prudent manner within the next 90 days. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Noble. Supervisor Kubicki. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Legislative Committee met last month on July 20th, and I failed to mention at that meeting that we had uh, in July that the resolution number eight, resolution of authorizing the placement of the no November 2010 ballot of, of an advisory referendum question regarding a possible additional tax for mass transit purposes failed at our committee for a lack of a second. Uh, the Legislative Committee will continue to review and monitor state activities on the CARM and mass transit and will continue healthy dialogue in the upcoming meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Gable. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to remind everybody that Relay for Life is Friday night at Bullen. It's a good time. It goes to a good cause. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I've been receiving the dog days of summer, a fundraiser for the dog parks out of Petrified Springs and in the county. They're looking for volunteers for the dunk tank. So looks like it might be kind of fun. That was it. I didn't see any hands immediately, but I'm sure they're, I'm, I'm sure they'll talk about it and uh, we'll probably have a few before the end of the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Supervisor Overman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we uh, had our, our last Highway and Parks meeting last night. Uh, a couple updates. Uh, everyone's aware there's numerous construction projects going on. Uh, if you leave Kenosha uh, and get west of Paddock Lake, you'll, you'll find uh, many lane changes. Uh, uh, Highway 50 is being totally redone there, concrete uh, in place of asphalt. Highway P and 50 intersection going to be totally redone uh, starting next week. Highway KD uh, turn lanes and uh, reconstruction for our proposed county park at, at, uh, at uh, Highway KD. Uh, golf report last night was not good. Uh, we had had a a very good start to the season. As everyone is aware, uh, June and July have been the, uh, in Milwaukee at least right now, record-breaking uh, wettest uh, summer. Uh, golf rounds are down because of that. Uh, and the golf course is in need of uh, numerous repairs. Our cart paths have been demolished by, by uh, potholes and runoff and uh, much time spent on, on repairs. Uh, on parks, there's a few events coming up and uh, Mr. Rudy has, uh, has really put together a, a, uh, a fine lineup as far as new ideas for the park system. August 14th, uh, at the new disc golf uh, park in Fox River Park, there's a tournament called Grin and Barrett and it's spelled B-E-A-R. So that is at Fox River Park New Disc Golf. Uh, August 20th, After Dark in the Park, Silver Lake. Those are the movies that I discussed last year and I think I've talked about this year. We have an outdoor screen. People camp at the, uh, at the park. Uh, there's snacks. There's, uh, uh, there's uh, supervision as far as the, uh, the camping and it's been very well attended and the the uh, attendance grows each time. August 21st, Dog Day of Summer, uh, that was mentioned uh, already, at Petrifying Springs, there's gonna be vendors there, it's a fundraiser for the dog parks. And August 27th, the, uh, the second movie event of, uh, of August, After Dark in the Park, is being held at Petrifying Springs. So that's all I have, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Elverman, if you don't mind my asking, we, we repaired after significant flooding in years past a number of the golf cart 
paths that ultimately we did as, as uh, an asphalt surface. Are those the paths that are being washed away? No, what it is is um, at the bottom, kind of a little curse of doing portions of asphalt paths. At the bottom of those asphalt paths is where we have huge washouts because the water naturally builds up speed. Uh, no damage on the asphalt paths. Petrifying springs, no damage. Uh, because we did, and it was mentioned at our meeting last evening uh, by Supervisor Noble, when we, when we were making money, and good money at the golf courses, we one year paved all the cart paths at Petrifying Springs. Uh, as time would show us, we should have spent that money at Brightondale because that is where there's a whole lot more uh, runoff and play and things. So where we have done work at, at Brightondale, uh, it's at the end of the asphalt cart pass. Trying to school golfers uh, and have them not leave the cart pass is where the biggest problem has been. They tell them when they rent carts when it's a little iffy, uh, do not leave the cart path even if there's water there. But they inevitably go around the water. Uh, then it starts to divot out the grass on the side. So there's significant damage uh, from these rains. We have gotten some money that goes back to the summer of 2008, uh, I believe, when we had significant rains. And we did get some FEMA money. Correct. They are trying, we got like $40,000 there. We were uh, not promised, but we were eligible for up to 100, and we are trying to get a little bit more of that now to do some of these repairs. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? No. Seeing no other lights. New business. PowerPoint presentation by Insight Consulting Architects Steve Marpole regarding architectural assessment of the exterior envelope of the court house and Molinero buildings. If I could, just by way of a uh, very brief introduction, um, you know, as you know, we have a significant physical plant in Kenosha County in terms of the number of buildings we have, properties we have, and, and maintenance is uh, always a key element with them. We just finished some repairs on this building. We're just wrapping up some repairs, uh, typical maintenance on the uh, Kenosha County Center, which is a building that I believe is some 20 five years old now, if I'm not mistaken, 20, give or take. Uh, and we have two significantly historic properties uh, in Kenosha County here in the downtown campus, which is the uh, courthouse and the Molinero building. Similar construction to Ruther High School, which is uh, across the park from here. And I'm sure you've all observed some of the repair work that's been going on over there. We have similar problems uh, here that they do, uh, that they have had over there, and uh, it's was a study was conducted. We have uh, Steve Marpole here from Insight who is going to go through what has transpired to date, where we sit with the project as of now, and uh, it's my uh, wish and hope that you all understand the uh, seriousness of what we're going to talk about and uh, keep that in mind as it, uh, we, we come upon our budget time for not only 2011 but uh, going forward with our capital plan. Understand the Building and Grounds Committee is going to look at this issue. Uh, thoroughly vet the options for how to how to uh, approach the maintenance on these two buildings and come forward with a plan to the county board county executive that can be built into uh, the 2011 budget and, and going forward to uh, repair and maintain these buildings as they need to be so with that I'm going to uh, turn it over to Mr. Marple and it's all uh, your show thank you what, what uh, I think what we'll do at the end uh, is we'll have some if there are questions we'll go ahead and address questions as well Okay, um, my name is Stephen Marpole. I'm an architect. I own uh, uh, Insight Consulting Architects. I have with me uh, Reiner Pliggy. He's my director of operations and he manages our Chicago office. Uh, Reiner is uh, one of the two architects that, that inspected the building, uh, rode the building in a man lift and in some uh, swing stages that you might have seen uh, and personally observed about 95% of all of the stones. 16,000 stones, roughly, uh, in both buildings. So that's who we are. What we do, uh, we are consulting architects. Um, we work with historic buildings and uh, buildings in general, helping people figure out 
problems um, in, a, in a forensic manner, but also helping people on a proactive uh, basis work with their building envelopes, uh, their, their building enclosures, uh, walls, windows, roofs, doors, that kind of thing. We've been doing it for 10 years. We've been in business for 10 years. Um, this building, or these buildings, are in uh, the um, Kenosha Civic Center uh, Historic District. And uh, the, uh, being uh, historic properties, uh, you are, I guess, mandated by the federal government to maintain them. Um, uh, that maintenance is administered by the state, so the, the repairs that, that we recommend will have to be approved by the state. And um, we have to follow the rules identified by the Secretary of the Interior. That's uh, part of the rules for historic structures. So what I'll do is I'll talk about uh, what sparked uh, the investigative process. Uh, our initial analysis and the need for detailed analysis, uh, the outline of the work budgeted for 2010 and performed to date, and a summary of the required scope of work and phasing options. Um, the Molinero uh, building was uh, restored approximately 15 years ago when it was uh, remodeled. Um, the scope of that work is really kind of unknown to us right now. I don't have good information as to exactly uh, what was done. Um, but as we get into this, you'll see that some of the things that were done were kind of uh, counter to uh, what we would normally see in a, in a, what we would call a proper restoration. Um, limestone displacement was noticed by the staff several years ago. Uh, there's a number of uh, um, open mortar joints. And again, as we get into this, you'll see uh, that there was some displacement. Uh, we visited the site informally in 2009 to evaluate the conditions. Uh, we observed that several areas needed emergency repairs because of stone fracture and displacement failure uh, at the Molinero building on the um, southwest and southeast corners. There were some, uh, some stone fracture that actually was um, in danger of falling. So uh, we recommended that some emergency repairs be uh, conducted, and they were. Uh, at that point, uh, we were invited to provide a proposal for a study. We completed the study in October and November of 2009. Uh, it was a limited study. We, we went around the building fairly quickly. It wasn't the type of documentation that we did in 2010. Um, uh, and I have a copy of the report here, and if I have time, we might get into that um, uh, exactly what was uh, initially discussed or discovered. Again, several emergency repairs uh, were executed prior to and during the initial investigation. Uh, we were invited to provide a proposal for architectural engineering design services to restore the facade to its 1925 condition. Um, as part of that work, um, uh, we performed a comprehensive analysis of the condition of the facade. That was when uh, Reiner and another architect from my office uh, went and actually uh, physically touched the majority of the stones, over 95% of the stones, sounding them with a mason's hammer to see exactly what their condition was as they uh, laid in state. We drew the elevations of, of, of uh, uh, the entire buildings, or both buildings, uh, identified every stone um, by zone, course number, and stone number. They're all uh, registered and in a database, and every stone was identified as far as what needs to be done to it. Um, and the end process of that is a, is a document that can actually be sent out for bidding purposes uh, for the restoration itself. That was completed uh, last uh, month, the end of last month. The initial analysis. Um, the parapets have been taking on uh, water for some time. This water has been working to the detriment of the condition of the parapets, primarily due to freeze-thaw conditions. So as the mortar joints open up, water gets in. At uh, certain times of the year, it's pretty bad here. Freeze thaw works on those stones and starts to displace them. The more displacement that occurs, the more water gets in, and the situation just continues and gets worse. Uh, several large, and I, by large I mean 700 pounds plus, uh, limestone pieces required emergency repairs. This was done by pinning the stones with stainless steel pins into the backup structure. 
Uh, there was one instance by the Molinero building where we had to cordon off the building. The stone was that loose and that uh, dangerous. Uh, those repairs were executed by the folks that were helping us uh, with access at the time. Uh, the column bases on the south facade are exhi exhibiting signs of damage from prolonged moisture exposure. Um, we are the architects that have been working on the Ruther project now for a better part of three years. Um, Ten million dollars worth of restoration will be complete in December. And the south facade at Ruther, just like the south facade here, has taken the brunt of the, uh, of the um, uh, damage to the exposure to the elements. Um, the south, uh, west and southeast corners of the Molinero building were falling near the cornice. Again, I mentioned that before. Uh, the cause of this failure won't be known until the repairs are made. There are some things that we simply can't discover until things are dismantled. Um, and the restoration of a uh, project that, at the Molinero building was, was uh, neither designed nor executed well. Now, um, I'm not condemning uh, the architects or engineers or anybody here. I'm just saying that, that 15 years ago, if a more comprehensive repair had been made, I think that we wouldn't be in the condition that we're in right now. Um, uh, the new parapet construction did not properly address potential water infiltration, which caused the significant damage that we talked about. Also, um, well, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, the new parapet stone does not uh, appear to have been properly strapped. Um, the majority of this building, different than Ruther, um, has uh, bond stones every other course. And I, I, technically what that means is that the brick and the stone are knitted together. At Ruther, they used steel straps to knit the, um, uh, the stone and the brick, the backup brick together, okay? Um, once we get up above the cornice and we're by the parapet where the, where the wall extends above the roof line, uh, there are no more bond stones. And there should have been straps installed at that point that would hold the stone to the brick. So when the water got in there, there was nothing really to hold it. At Ruther, the problem, eventually became a situation where those steel straps expanded when they, when they rusted, and that really was uh, uh, very damaging. The new roof at the Molinero building did not allow for the alleviation of moisture on the backside of the parapet. So the new rubber roof that was installed, uh, the flashings went all the way up the wall to the backside of the parapet. Water was getting in at the top of the wall. It got down and was in between the brick and the membrane, and it didn't have anywhere to go. And again, freeze thaw worked on the brick, and that brick has essentially been pulverized over time. Uh, these are uh, photos with captions from, um, from our first report. The second report, which actually is, is a, a bidding document, is approximately 1,800 pages long. There's 100 pages of drawings and uh, 1,200 pages of database reports that, that identify, again, every stone, stone by stone, and what needs to happen to it. Um, I'll just briefly go through these, these photos, and you can see it probably better in your handout than you can on the screen, although in some cases the, the issues are egregious enough that you can really see, even up there. Um, here we see a mortar patch that was uh, conducted in, up at the upper corner, but more importantly, this is one of those failed corners, severely deteriorated, cracked, displaced stone masonry. So you can see the dark line um, where the top arrow is, and the bottom arrow is actually pointing to a hairline crack that you may or may not be able to see in your photo. Uh, that is where the crack was starting to actually migrate down, and there was a crack on both sides of the corner, and it was a situation where the stone was in danger of falling. Again, uh, all of the parapet stones uh, have displaced in some fashion, some more than others. The Molinero is worse uh, than the courthouse building. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the problem doesn't exist at the courthouse. Uh, there's a failed mortar joint, there are failed stones, uh, there are stone debris and mortar debris all over uh, the structure, falling off the wall and landing on uh, ledges. This uh, photo is of a severely displaced stone. You can see where there's a dark shadow line to the left of the corner. 
That dark shadow line should not be there. That stone is displaced at least a half an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch. Again, that's through primarily through water getting in, freezing, and pushing the stone outward. Open mortar joints at the um, at that top line of stones, that's called a coping. Um, and at the bottom of that line of stones, there is a horizontal joint that's completely wide open. And again, more displaced stones. Uh, this next one, this is the uh, one of the big stones that was uh, very close to um, the condition where it might fall. It might have fallen. So we cordoned off uh, part of the grounds around Molinero until this could be pinned uh, properly. Again, in the next photo, you can see a lot of displaced mortar, uh, failed uh, open mortar joints. And again, another stone uh, dangerously out of plumb. Uh, the next uh, photo, um, you can see displacement happening there. That, that condition more than likely, I would say almost certainly, did not, condi or, uh, did not exist um, when the building was first built. Uh, but the stones have displaced over time. You can see the chimney uh, beyond that. And you can see two copper cables. That's for lightning protection. Um, and um, I don't know, is, is Ron hunting here? Okay. Ron wanted us to recommend removal of the chimney because it is a maintenance issue and it essentially is a dead element in the building. It's not uh, being used for anything. But in terms of the historic nature of the building and the historic fabric of the building, that, that uh, tall chimney will have to stay. Again, another failed corner. And more of the same pieces of mortar, stone displacements, failed mortar joints. Um, there's some pretty good shots of some water staining, uh, open joints above, water staining below the cornice. This line, there's that. The top edge is the coping. The, the first ledge, so to speak, is the cornice. There's a lot of staining and damage on the stones uh, at the cornice level. Again, more of the same. Uh, this is at the south entrance. Uh, there is a cracked or split baluster. What happens there is, these, the, uh, obviously they're made of stone. They're actually pinned to the, uh, to the rail on the top of the baluster. Uh, water gets into that joint where the pin is. It's made of, of carbon steel, and the steel rusts, corrodes, it expands, and it cracks. Um, this is one of the conditions that um, we're pretty sure of the, uh, the, the cause. Um, it is uh, at the bottom of the colonnade at the entrance. It's fairly low slope there. The water and snow, et cetera, can sit up there. It gets the southern sun, so there's a lot of thaw and freeze and thaw. And the bases of the columns are degraded, and they're going to have to be repaired. The columns are monolithic. They are one piece of stone. They're just like at Ruther. They're absolutely gorgeous. But if we have to, if we let this get to the point where they have to be removed in order to properly support them, um, they'd be uh, tremendously expensive. Steve, if I could just interject, I, I want to point out something on the two pictures we're looking at here, the one with the crack in the column, the top of the column on the previous slide. Okay. Uh, here. Uh, what, what's so important about this is this crack is at the top of the column. I guess what would be three stories in the air on the back side of the column. The only way you're going to know that that is there is to get up and inspect the building, thoroughly inspect the building, walk behind this colonnade up against the building, which is a pretty small space to be, uh, to be getting into. But in, in my opinion, that points to the importance of making sure that we're doing regular inspections. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Arbit and Mr. Martinelli have begun to uh, put those plans in place that will allow us to do a little bit more of a uh, thorough regular inspection evaluation of our buildings. And this is the type of thing that clearly has been there a while, which means the inspections haven't been being done, uh, which ultimately puts you in a position that we're in right now. I mean, this isn't a crack that opened up from one year to the next. No, that is correct. Uh, 
Um, here is actually, it's an interesting photo. I'm not sure when this wedge was installed, but you can see where it says shim wedge. That may have been from original construction. It's actually a wooden wedge that was put in place to set the level of the stone and uh, they mortared up to it on one side and started and mortared up against it on the other side and never removed the shim. But you can see that there's a considerable amount of moisture even here where they're staining all around. It's still wet there. Uh, that, that wood is an, is an avenue for um, water movement through the wall. Uh, as a result of our initial um, uh, walkthrough and study, uh, we identified priorities one, two um, as things that needed to be addressed should not be deferred. Um, and uh, priority three, again, we recommend that those items that are on that list of things to do uh, shouldn't be deferred because to, to gain access to the upper reaches of the building and the uh, things that you need to do to take care of the priority one and two items, you're, you're paying a, a great deal for that access. You might as well take advantage of it and take care of the priority three things. There really was very little um, priority four. So outline of the work budgeted for uh, 2010 and performed to date. Okay, we researched and documented the construction and verified all conditions in the field. Again, looking at the existing drawings that we were able to find and spending a lot of time in the field actually mapping the structure. Uh, we performed a comprehensive physical study, like we talked about before, sounding uh, every stone that we could get at with a sounding hammer. Um, we further confirmed the scope of the work. Um, additional damage was doc documented on the south facade of the courthouse um, at, at the colonnade, and also at the east end of the north facade of the courthouse, evidence of significant movement of the facade was observed. The cause of this movement, like the corners that were shearing on the Molinero building, these are actually directly opposite those. Um, we're not sure exactly what caused that. It could have been the pavement project that, that uh, occurred, uh, the, uh, quite a bit of um, vibration and a lot of uh, uh, work was done in the courtyard and the heavy equipment might have caused some of the issues. Uh, that's all conjecture on my part, but things for the most part, other than the fact that those stones on the Molinero building were moving potentially dynamically uh, everything looks to be fairly stable, uh, at least at the courthouse in that, uh, that northeast corner. Uh, we compiled documentation for the complete rehab and uh, restoration of the Kenosha County Courthouse for the Molinero building. So we've com we basically, have, through the course of the study, have completed documents that can be used to bid this project, similar to what was done at Ruther. I'll just say parenthetically that at Ruther, our uh, estimate for phase three was $8.2 million. The bids came in at $8.2 million, and the spread between the two lowest bidders was $60,000. So we have a pretty good track record. That's an example of it. We have a pretty good track record of hitting, our, hitting the budgets once we get a chance to study a building to the level we've studied this building. I'm going to get into a summary of the required scope of work. Uh, restore all stonework. I'll, I'll, I'll go through the major uh, parts first and then we'll get into the bits and pieces. Uh, restore all the stonework. Rebuild all the parapets. Replace all roof membrane systems. Replace all windows. Restore all exterior stairs. <coughs> restore the skylights. Improve lighting at the central stair and skylight. So to restore all the stonework, um, we need to maintain the building fabric as much as possible, the original construction. So as the building is repaired, it will have to be dismantled in part. Those, no, those stones ought to be numbered and stored and then reinstalled exactly as they were. That, uh, again, is a state mandate. Uh, we'll repair the stones where possible. There are stone patching materials similar to what was used on this building last year. Um, there's also some um, epoxy crack injections that we can do in certain cases uh, to repair stones. There's a number of different things we can do, but we will repair whenever possible. Uh, remove, store, and reset where required. Replace only when absolutely necessary. I believe, Reiner, correct me if I'm wrong, that we've saved over 90% of the stone at, at uh, Ruther. Yeah, okay. And, um, by the time we're done, over a third of this, the entire stones will have been manipulated in some way, carried to the ground or carried uh, and pulled off the wall so that where other work could be done. 
Um, and then at the end, all stone areas will be cleaned uh, without damage to the material. There's very specific, the state, for whatever reason, has decided to get specific on this particular issue. I think it's because there were some problems with uh, previous cleaning uh, methodologies similar to what was done at Ruther. Uh, some of the stones were burned, quote unquote, burned there. Um, the state's very specific about that and um, we follow those uh, rules uh, to the T. Uh, rebuild all parapets with new solid brick and stainless steel clips, straps, and pins. When we're done, at the parapets in particular uh, that are gonna have to be rebuilt, um, it will all be put together with stainless steel straps and pins. It will be a, a multi-generational fix. Um, replace all roof membrane systems. The, the ballasted rubber roof that's at the Molinero building is at the end of its service life. There's a number of leaks that are happening, I think, in the DA's office and in several other locations. Um, certainly the roof on this building is, is at the end of its maintainable service life. And as long as we're doing all of this work and all this uh, stonework is going to have to be done, there's going to be a considerable amount of damage done to the roof just in that process, even with proper protection. And we'll want to replace the roofs. Uh, increasing, okay, also we'll have the added benefit of increasing uh, thermal performance all, all the uh, roof areas. We'll design heavy duty, uh, low maintenance um, membrane roof systems, um, systems that can take a beating and, and not show too much sign for wear and tear. They'll last at least 30 years. And most of the systems that we specify, after 30 years, you inspect the roof, you do several repairs, you can put another layer of cap sheet on top and get another 10 year warranty. So you can actually get um, 30, 40, 50 years out of some of these roof systems. Uh, replace all windows, design proper window flashings and tie-ins uh, to existing structure increase thermal performance of all windows. The windows, uh, when we did our very thorough inspection, the windows really are at the end of their service life. Their uh, seals are, are broken. They were never really uh, designed to a, a standard uh, or installed uh, to a standard that we would like to adhere to today with proper flashings. Uh, water's been getting in in those locations um, uh, over time. Um, for the stairs, there's a lot of broken granite treads, uh, particularly on the south side. Um, they will all be repaired or replaced as required. Uh, the skylights, um, we have uh, designed new modern skylight systems with increased R values um, and they're much better at handling uh, water. And I'm just talking about the outer covering of the skylight. All of the, um, the decorative parts, of the art glass of the skylights will be left in place. And uh, there has been some concern about the amount of light at the main central stair landing um, up towards the third, well, at the top floor. And um, we have, uh, or actually I don't know that that design is complete, but uh, LED lighting systems, high efficiency, uh, long life LED lighting systems that will improve that lighting. I say budget here. Um, what we've done is at the end of this comprehensive uh, study, and the identifying of all of the work that needs to be done, um, we estimate that the entire project will cost roughly $5 million. Um, we shared some of our documentation with uh, several restoration contractors who concurred that our numbers with respect to the stone repair uh, were accurate. So we feel pretty confident about that. But actually, you know, the only way to, to get a, a real true number of how much this is going to cost would be to bid it. Phasing options. I, I sh am proposing two options. Um, none of the options that I would propose would, would have a phased two-year process. Basically, it will take about a 12-month process to do all of the work. If you phase the work where you start and stop, and then start and stop again, and I check this with uh, the contractors, you're looking at anywhere from two to three hundred thousand dollars of added costs for the demobilization and the remobilization for those projects. So option one is to complete all work in one phase starting 1-2011. Uh, we like to recommend starting work at the beginning of the year. It's cold at that time and there's a lot of snow obviously, but you can install scaffolding at that time 
And by the time the scaffolding is installed completely, you can do some a limited demolition without having to um, excuse me, reconstruct walls. Uh, obviously, you can't have freezing temperatures if you're going to be uh, using mortar. Um, right now, there's an excellent bidding climate. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Our, our numbers are coming in good in all of our projects. Um, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent lower than estimates than what uh, we were seeing in uh, strong economic times. Uh, large scale restoration companies are bidding very aggressively right now. Uh, there's a potential to take advantage, uh, in, in this case, of a large restoration company continuing operations in Kenosha. Bergman Construction out of Chicago, who does hundreds of projects a year, they're the ones doing Ruther. They're already here, so their mobilization costs will make them more competitive. Again, those better numbers in a competitive environment will mean potentially better numbers for you. And then uh, Winter Start makes, uh, takes advantage of the colder weather for scaffolding erection, set up a mobilization. Uh, option two, complete all work in two phases starting in uh, one of uh, 2011. Again, you take advantage of the excellent bidding climate that we're seeing right now, but that stop and start process is very expensive. So we, we really uh, would recommend that you not uh, go that route. But it is an option that you can consider, of course, because it's a significant amount of, amount of money that uh, we're talking about. I understand that. Um, due to the scope, the nature, scope, and scale of the defects, we don't recommend deferring this work at all. Uh, we really think that you should get to this before it gets to the point of Ruther. Ruther is a $10 million project, roughly, uh, with all phases considered, and that was for stone only. Um, they are roughly equivalent uh, between Ruther and, and the two building campus, or the, the courthouse and the, uh, the jail. Uh, same, roughly the same number of stones, roughly the same amount of square footage of wall area. Uh, similar uh, constraints for the contractors as they bring the stone down and have to lay it down. And they're very similar projects. Um, but Ruther was in much worse condition. And that had to do with the type of construction that they had there. Um, you're moving to that point, And I think that now is the time that you take care of it so that you're not you know, doubling the cost in the course of maybe 10 years. Uh, we've created a bid process that will allow the county to pull scope from the project to adhere to the budget. So um, several of the items that we have planned for the restoration uh, are lower priority and they can be pulled from the, the, the uh, documents so that you can um, uh, make sure that you hit the budget that you need just in case. And then, of course, we recommend a contingency fund be established to handle any unforeseeable defects. When you dig into a wall like this, it's solid brick and stone. When you dig in there, you never really know what you're going to find. We can predict, but there's going to be unforeseeable conditions. At Ruther, the change orders have been very, very minimal, uh, and they've been, they've been very fortunate in that regard. Pardon me? <laughs> No, Jimmy Hoff is not there. Okay, so I'll take questions now. Um, let's uh, let's do this. If you have a question, please push your uh, button, and I will take you in order here. Supervisor Noble. Yeah, uh, thank you. I um, recall from a previous presentation in committee that you said there's a limited number of contractors that can actually do this work. Uh, that we would recommend do the work that are more capable of doing it properly. Okay. Um, that there are contractors um, and, you know, for whatever reason in Wisconsin there just aren't as many uh, or really there aren't any that could, uh, any masonry restoration contractors that could bond this amount of work. So it really becomes a general contractor's job, which of course elevates costs. Okay? And so, in, you know, but, but in, you know, we've got probably five different uh, contractors in Chicago uh, and one out of the Twin Cities that probably wouldn't come because they're non-union, but large enough to handle this as far as bonding goes. So as a follow-up to that, I, I thought it was, is it, it seemed unusual to me that you would actually share your estimates with contractors given there's so few that can do it. And, and no, I, di I didn't share my estimate. I asked them what they, what they um, thought the project would cost. 
they gave me their numbers independent of each other. Okay. And I didn't share that with anybody. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir, first of all, with the uh, your study, currently should any of the building be um, fenced off? I mean, is it cur I know you initially stated that you did some emergency um, work to the to the two structures and even reviewing this um, when a uh, architect or anyone says dangerous I mean that's very concerning but uh, currently should there be any protection put around at, at least just for in my opinion no uh, we've been around the building uh, and the issues that were the most egregious that the ones that we considered dangerous have been dealt with to my knowledge so I would suggest no but what I would recommend is that we are very you know, vigilant or diligent in our uh, periodic inspection of the facade. Now that we know, to, no matter what, uh, how you decide to proceed with the project or, you know, what the timing of it is, I guarantee you we have full-time people uh, at Ruther, Reiner being one of them, uh, we're watching the buildings like a hawk, so we're really, you know, going to stick to, uh, you know, looking it over and making sure that we're not seeing anything that's pretty scary. But right now, as, as I, as I see it, we're we're in good condition. Reiner, would you concur with that? Yeah. Okay. And then just one other question: You said approximately five million. Is that just for the stonework, or when you're saying you said regarding roofs, you talked about windows? No. That's I mean, that's for everything that it's all inclusive. Um, as far as the work of the contract is concerned. So all of the things that we're proposing be done, uh, the skylight work, the, the stair work, um, obviously there's some work in the grounds that'll be done uh, where the granite is cracking and falling apart. Uh, but all of that work is included in that, in that estimate. And you also said if it's not done within the next couple of years, you, you, your belief is that the expense to replace would be substantially more? Yeah, what we experienced at Ruther, quite frankly, was an exponential increase in the, the issues. Now, um, the, uh, the issues came to light even more so when we went around the building aggressively with, with a sounding hammer and removed what we considered to be unsound stone. Um, but I would say in the last, I've been, I've been working with uh, Kenosha Unified for 10 years and we were watching that building um, and once it got to the point where, all right, we need to take care of this, and we started to, that process, by the time the process was done and the project started, things were getting really bad. There were large pieces of stone were falling. We've got samples of, of, of pieces of stone that are you know, as big as my head that were falling to the ground. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Alberman. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure what page this is on, but it's under initial analysis and the need for additional analysis. Uh, headline, the, the restoration project at the Molinero building was neither designed nor executed well. I'm assuming if this was done 15 years ago that whoever, whoever designed this and executed the project was under the same state guidelines that any new contractor would be. Uh, do you have any opinion, without getting yourself in, in any legal problem, uh, why we would be going through these problems 15 years later if these contractors were under the same guidelines that, that you have uh, investigated? Well, to my knowledge, or to my understanding right now, I, I really don't know what the scope of that project was, so I can't really speak to that. But if any work was done, it should have been done to a, a higher degree. If it had been done to a higher degree, we wouldn't find ourselves in this position today. I guess that's, that's where I was going with that. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure a lot of this work was done after I was a county board supervisor, so I'm not sure if this was even 15 years ago, a lot of the work that was done there. I mean, we've we have uh, done work in the last six or seven years on running uh, the uh, area for prisoners coming in and, and things. Uh, is any of that in question here? Any of that more recent work? No, I don't believe any of the 
renovation work that was done in conjunction with either the DA office being moved in there and, and rehabbing that building, uh, or for that matter, the addition of the bridge across is uh, in doubt in any way, other than some of this exterior addressing of the exterior that may have been part and parcel to one or the other of those projects. So nothing that is new construction is of question, and Mr. Arbor, if you disagree with that, you can certainly. Right, Alderman, the, the research that we've done, we've been trying to figure out exactly what was done. There was the interior work that was done as part of, I don't want to call it the restoration, but remodeling of that building. Right. And there was that piece, and we kind of identified who did that. But as far as what specific exterior work was done, talking with maintenance staff, there's people that remember stones being taken off the parapet on a Molinero building, labeled, identified. Uh, work done and stuff be put back in place, but if you look, the bulk of those pictures that Steve showed of Molinero are all that parapet stuff that is, right. th that's when I first, last summer, probably a year ago, when I went up there, because we were having water leaks and the staff took me up there, and the walls, which are supposed to be straight as an arrow, were all broken loose, uh, both this way as well as vertically and horizontally. And that's when we brought Steve in to take a look and see, you know, because the question was asked, how long is this supposed to last? And that, I remember asking you when we were up on that roof, if this was done right, how long should this last? What did I tell you? And <laughs> you told me it should push 100 years. 100 years, yeah. If it's done properly and maintained properly. That's the caveat, is that it's inspected yeah. and, and, there, and, you know, and, and routine maintenance, preventive maintenance is done. But it should last 100 years. Yeah, 80 to 100 years, easily, if it's done properly. And Again, it has, it, has to, it has to be maintained. Uh, right. mortar, mortar joints need to be uh, observed and, and repaired over the time. You know, regular maintenance has to be done, but definitely. And the example you had given then was on the courthouse. What was the year the courthouse was constructed? Do you know what year the oh, courthouse was? Oh, that would have been uh, 1925. 1925. And that one hasn't had any, ma that, that I'm aware of anyways, any major restoration work done to the exterior of the building till now. And there's been cutting and pasting up there. There's evidence of literally caulking being put in mortise joints and things like that, but there hasn't been any major work to the exterior of that building that, that I'm aware of at this point. So... Anything so else, Supervisor? Yeah, so Mr. Chairman, if, if, uh, if there is some question on when things were done, um, I would think it's fairly simple to look back at our construction documents for, for the last 15 years. Um, and see if some of that, because I'm, I'm sure there should be some type of uh, warranties on, on some of this information. And if uh, it's something as simple as possibly contacting some of our former employees who oversaw this work, um, I'm sure if you go back the last 20 years, you could contact Mr. Patry and find out um, when certain things was, were done uh, and what was done. Uh, I think for building and grounds, that might be helpful uh, to see if uh, we have any uh, any warranties, any any recourse on any of this construction, if we're looking at things that have failed in 15 years. Uh, we might not be. I don't know, and I'm sure we haven't gotten that information this evening. So, I would suspect the issue of warranties is long... Uh long expired I would assume but but I but would certainly also I would expect that we have uh, an archive somewhere that can give us a little bit more information than we have and uh, mr. Patry may well be a good source if we reached out to him so. I guess what I'm getting at mr. chairman is warranties are one thing but integrity of a local company that possibly did the workmanship I agree would be would be what I would be getting at I trust the uh, chairman of building and grounds will uh, work to uncover what can be anything else Thank you. Supervisor Grady. You could, if you could move to this mic, maybe it would be helpful. Uh, just so I can understand this document in front of me, um, the approximate $5 million price tag would be for both buildings, is that correct? That is correct. And you said in your comments you thought it would take approximately one year of time to restore these buildings, is that right? Yes. Okay. In the event that this were to go through and this were to be done, would you see both projects being done concurrently, or would it be one building at one time and then one at the other? How do you foresee that? It depends on how you want to phase it. If we phased it as two separate projects, we might actually separate the two buildings, even though the, court, uh, the courthouse building is going to be a larger piece. It would be a larger phase, but that would be one logical way to do it. 
Um, but as I conceive of it, it would be a concurrent project. Uh, the way Ruther has worked out and the way these projects typically work out is the contractors' um, means and methods are under their control. They work with the owner to make sure that, that they're disturbing the people inside the building as little as possible. But they like to move around from one part of the building to the next depending on uh, you know, any number of conditions. So, so, in, 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 so my, I guess what I'm saying is that more than likely they would stage both buildings at the same time. So from a logistics standpoint, you're saying it is possible in a one-year time period to conceivably do both buildings at the same time, both being under construction at the same time. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. That's all my comment. Thank you. Supervisor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Michael asked a question of the gentleman uh, where the, if there were items that needed immediate attention and the response that was given was to the best of my knowledge. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Arbit, are you, in your opinion, has the uh, county addressed the emergency issues and are there any immediate safety concerns uh, today? Yep, we work pretty close with Steve and if you get a chance, and I know that we've got, as he indicated, the documents that they put together Literally every, every stone on the building has been given an ID number of the 16,000 some stones. There's an 1800 page document that's been put together. So in terms of the degree of thoroughness that Steve and Reinert have put into this, when he's told me in his professional expertise uh, that he's got things covered right now and we're secure, we don't have a Milwaukee situation on our hands, I feel comfortable in, in what he's telling me. So yeah, I, I believe that the, the building is secure, that we're, we're not in danger of having something fall off and hurt somebody. Okay. Um, and then the uh, other question I had, uh, you indicated that you were not aware of any Wisconsin contractors that were capable of doing this work? Uh, w uh, when I say no Wisconsin contractors, I mean Wisconsin contractors that specialize in limestone restoration. Um, there, are, there are none. That, that can even approach this project because of their, their bonding capabilities. So. I just asked the question because I would certainly like to see Wisconsin contractors, but. Um. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of discussion with that, uh, with Unified um, and uh, the, the contractor that was selected. Um, they're sourcing their materials almost 100% from the Wisconsin side of the border and 90% of the labor is uh, from the local union. Uh, so the, the labor itself is, is local. Um, really, it's, it's only the supervisors um, and, and, of course, then the company is out of, out of Chicago. So I would hope that if we undertake this project that we have some emphasis on uh, Wisconsin and local labor. Um, just the last comment. Um, undertaking this project, likely it would be a 20-year bond that would be issued for this sort of project and probably without having the exact numbers, but just on principle only, the levy impact would be about 250000 a year. With the interest, it may be a total of 325000 a year would be the impact. So just so everybody has an idea. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Marple? Saying none. Uh, I have one last thing I'd like to say, and yes, I, I mean this sincerely. If any of you would like to see uh, the work that's being done at Ruther, uh, is an excellent contractor. We're very proud of our work. Uh, we'd love to uh, take you individually or as a large group. Uh, Berglund has, has um, indicated that they would uh, be very happy to do so as well. Um, and if you would like to see the final document or the, the, this monstrously large document that we generated, uh, again, we're very proud of our work. I'd love to show that to you. Um, to bring it in here would have been kind of, I mean, it's counterproductive, but it is a, it's a very large comprehensive uh, document of your building. So. No other questions? We'll move on. Appreciate your, uh, your time and the presentation. Thank you.
Clerk. County Executive Appointments. Number 23, Fred Eckernis to serve on the Kenosha County Local Emergency Planning Committee. Refer to Judiciary and Law. 24, Jim Huff to serve on the Kenosha County Local Emergency Planning Committee. Also refer to Judiciary and Law. 25, Kimberly Brunig to serve on the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. Refer to Land Use. Claims, Charles Kennedy denied medical care while incarcerated. Refer to Corporation Counsel. Robert Bell, broken windshield. Again, Corporation Counsel referral. Ike Edwards, broken windshield. And refer to Corporation Counsel. Approval of the July 20th, 2010 minutes by Supervisor Kohlmeyer. Supervisor Kohlmeyer. Motion to approve the minutes of July 20, 2010. Is there a second? Second by Supervisor Grulick. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Motion to adjourn. Supervisor Clark, seconded by Supervisor Michael. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? We are adjourned.